T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Up until the Challenger accident, NASA was a very untypical government agency. We were inventing as we went along, so you had a lot of freedom. It was viewed internationally as a fantastic place. The Apollo missions gave it an aura of invincibility. We were taken as the international leader in the space race, and no one was really expecting anything to go wrong. The Apollo program uh, over the years that it actually operated had very few launches, but NASA had uh, some very ambitious plans. Four minutes and 27 seconds to go before the start of this historic mission. The year was 1981, and NASA was about to amaze the world with Columbia, a new spacecraft that pushed the limits of imagination. They never before have sent a spacecraft into orbit that is going to come down as a plane. Instead of using a single rocket, like Apollo, the shuttle was attached to an external fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters. Each of the boosters was constructed of joined metal tubes, and the field joints were sealed with two rubber gaskets called O-rings. Look at those huge engines getting ready to catapult this strange assemblage off the Earth. But all this technology wasn't cheap, and NASA had to come up with a new funding model. The creation of the whole shuttle program came in a different economic era than the Apollo program. So Congress and NASA decided the shuttle program could pay its way by carrying payloads into orbit. The Department of Defense, private contractors that wanted experiments done in space, would pay them to take them up on the shuttle. It was going to be a real routine expressway to space. And unlike Apollo, the shuttle system was going to be almost entirely reusable. They had to return this hardware back into space as rapidly as they could. It wasn't long into the program they realized that that process was far more difficult than they ever anticipated. They were under constant pressure to launch. T minus 10, 9, 8. I'm getting a few butterflies uh, sure. myself right now. We've gone for main engine start. We have. Columbia was a fantastic success. 
but NASA had to figure out how to make these technological feats routine. They predicted in the beginning that they would be able to launch 60 shuttles a year, that NASA would, in fact, become self-paying or self-funded. We had two pads up and running, so you'd have two vehicles out on the pad, and they were going to launch like three days apart. But that really never happened. It was an experimental technology, and they just couldn't manage that many so they continually fell behind. The shuttle program never had more than nine launches in a single year. We have a beautiful picture now, it's coming through. And to help meet their ambitious schedules, NASA worked with private contractors to build many of the shuttle systems, while NASA engineers analyzed data to see how well everything performed. NASA kept very good records of anomalies. The problem is, is that they ran into a lot of these. One thing engineers saw was the O-rings that sealed the booster joints weren't behaving according to design. On several flights, especially those at cold temperatures, rocket propellant had blown by the primary O-ring. The first time it happened, they accepted it. They tested it. They thought they knew what had happened. And then the next launch, everything worked. And then a few more launches, and it happened again. But each time, the secondary O-ring prevented gases from escaping the side of the booster. So rather than stalling the program to redesign the joint, NASA waived the requirements governing O-rings, which effectively made it acceptable to fly with minimal erosion. Even with the worst O-ring erosion they'd ever had, it hadn't failed. So they started to work on it, but they really weren't rushing. It didn't seem so terrible, but they continually expanded the bounds of acceptable risk. And then came the 10th Challenger launch, and a mission unlike any NASA had attempted before. They decided to make that the first flight that an ordinary citizen can fly, and that drew a tremendous interest from the public, plus the school systems are going to show this live on television. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to a, perhaps the person you, you came to see, and that's uh, Krista McCullough, my payload specialist, teacher in space. My job at the time of the Challenger was the director of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Motor Project for my company, Morton Thiokol. Morton Thiokol was an engineering firm out of Brigham City, Utah, and had the NASA contract to build the shuttle boosters. Well, I am so excited to be here, and I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. On the day before Challenger, there was an overnight low that was record-breaking. Got a telephone call from one of the program managers back in Utah that worked for me. And he says, Al, he says, we just heard that it might get down as low as 18 degrees by tomorrow morning. Good grief, I said, I'm really worried about these O-ring seals being able to operate properly at those kind of temperatures. The mission had already been rescheduled after routine delays. So now, Morton Thiokol and NASA scheduled an emergency teleconference the night before the launch. The engineers at Thiokol were very concerned. So they began scrambling to put together an analysis of temperature data. Larry Malloy was NASA's project manager for the solid rocket boosters. Then we went out to the teleconference. And uh, Roger Bourgelet, who was, who was kind of the O-ring czar at, at Morton Thiokol, did most of the talking. The recommendation was that we wait until it's 54 degrees before we launch. So I said something like, 54 degrees where? They had never drawn a temperature line before. And it meant a tremendous change to the shuttle's schedule. It isn't what they wanted to hear. In fact, uh, Larry made a comment. Thiokol, when the hell do you want me to launch? Next April? Thiokol's engineers in Utah were caught off guard by NASA's strong reaction to their recommendation, so they asked if they could have some time off the teleconference to review the data in private. And after they went offline, Al McDonald was visibly upset. And he said, I wouldn't want to be the guy that had to appear at a board of inquiry if this thing blows. And I said, I understand that, Alan. You won't have to. That'll be me. At Viacall, the vice president was asking those engineers to stand up for what they said. 
Roger Beaujolais took the lead in the objections. He said, I, I can't prove it to you. All I know is that it's away from goodness in our experience space. But the engineers at Thiokol didn't have the data. So the vice president took the decision-making away from the engineers and asked the managers to decide. And they did. More than 30 minutes after the engineers had gone offline, Thiokol managers voted to reverse the recommendation and to launch the challenger as planned. The teleconference became a focal point for the White House-appointed Rogers Commission that investigated NASA after the disaster. There was not one positive statement for launch ever made in that room. What was driving here? What, what was to be achieved that uh, caused you to go? NASA pressured the folks at Thiokol to change their mind. And it was clear to me that we finally came back and gave them what they wanted to hear. You know, we've been rationalizing this erosion since the second flight. None of the information the NASA managers were getting was new. This was not individuals getting used to something. This was organizationally supported. That's where the accident was inevitable. Once Thiokol reversed their initial recommendation, someone needed to sign off on the launch rationale. I did the smartest thing I ever did in my lifetime. I refused to sign it. I just felt it was too much risk to take. So just before midnight, McDonald's boss, Joe Kilminster, signed off instead. After the disaster, the commission concluded cold and joint design were major factors in Challenger's O-ring failure. It also squarely pointed a finger at NASA managers like Malloy. The commission did recognize that there was pressure to launch, but they saw as it enacted by amorally calculating managers who were in positions of responsibility. I found something completely different. So Vaughn began her own investigation. No one wanted this to happen, but intuition, you know, I don't feel good about this, should have been okay. And they applied all the usual rules in a situation where the usual rules didn't apply. Four, three, two, one. made a grievous error. So the real crux of the matter is, how do you get people to recognize when you need to do something different than what you've been trained to do? After Challenger, the Rogers Commission prompted many changes at NASA, including an increase in the program's budget, adding a third O-ring to the booster joints, and moving some managers, including Malloy, out of the shuttle program. But there was nothing really about how to change the organization that came out of the commission report. Good morning, Discovery! Rise and shine, boys. It took two years for NASA to launch another shuttle. But once it was away, the program had 15 years of successful missions. On Discovery. And then in 2003 came the 28th Columbia launch, the space shuttle that started it all. It seemed like any other launch. But on the second day, someone called me on the phone and said, you've heard about the large piece of debris or foam that came off the tank and hit the left wing caused a cloud, a poof. I said, no, I didn't. Columbia made it into orbit safely, but the concern was that if debris had caused damage to the left wing, the point of impact could be vulnerable to extreme heat and turbulence on re-entry. So just days after the launch, NASA formed a special team to assess the damage. We're supposed to have this analysis all wrapped up in three days, but we didn't know exactly where it hit. We needed a photo, an image that definitely says, here's where it hit, and here's the damage. And the best visuals the team had to work with were a few grainy photos captured at launch. The decision to ask for more data, the need for it, was unanimous. 
but smaller foam and other debris had fallen from shuttles before without catastrophe. And since Columbia was already in orbit, getting better imagery meant NASA must do it from space, most likely by taking shots of the shuttle's underside from a nearby satellite. The next day, I get an email saying the answer is no. I called up the chief engineer and said, uh, why don't you back this up? And he said, well, I don't want to be a chicken little about this. And I was stunned by that response. And I said, uh, chicken little, the program's acting like an ostrich with its head in the sand. Management was worried about unnecessarily diverting Columbia from its mission, since foam damage had been generally considered to be a non-threatening maintenance concern. Linda Hamm, the chair of the management team, finally put the issue to rest on teleconference eight days into the mission, while Columbia's crew orbited above. We could lose an entire tile. I mean, it could be a, a significant area of tile damage. He was just uh, reiterating, it was Calvin, uh, that he doesn't believe that there is any um, burn through, so no a safety flight kind of issue. It's more of a turnaround issue, similar to what we've had on other flights. All right, any questions on that? In the end, Ham received three requests for imaging from different parts of NASA. And they were all put down for different reasons. The similarity between Challenger and Columbia was the falling back on routine under uncertain circumstances. The day before the teleconference, NASA sent their only communication to the Columbia astronauts about the debris strike. And on February 1st, 2003, the crew began their return to Earth. Part of our engineering culture is that you should work through your chain of command. I will regret always why I didn't break the door down by myself. And we're ready, Willie, no deltas. Everything look good to you? I don't see anything out of the ordinary. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. They had just started the deorbit burn. They're coming down. And um, we started seeing temperatures change higher on the left side versus the right. FYI, I've just lost four separate temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle. The anomalous data confirmed my worst fear. Columbia Houston UHF comm check. Columbia Houston, UHF comm check. I looked up and I saw one of our chief engineers in tears. We can't get the crew, she said. They've been incommunicado. It happened. It happened. Columbia was destroyed on re-entry. After the disaster, Vaughn worked closely with the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, which concluded that NASA had ineffective leadership and a flawed safety culture. We are quite convinced that these organizational matters are just as important uh, as the foam. Ham soon left the shuttle program, and Vaughn's insights into organizational decision-making have proven relevant far beyond the walls of NASA. This happens in many different kinds of organizations. I don't think that the general public got the position of either Larry Malloy or Linda Ham, and that their behavior was to a great deal determined by working in a very rule-oriented organization. After Columbia, NASA restructured the shuttle program's management team and required an inspection of the orbiter's underbelly on all trips to the International Space Station. All told, NASA had 133 successful shuttle missions apart from the Challenger and Columbia tragedies. But in its more than 30 years of operation, the program was never able to cover costs. And in 2011, it all came to an end when Atlantis touched down at Kennedy Space Center and NASA fully turned its attentions to smaller, unmanned spacecraft. Today, NASA pays the Russian space agency to carry American astronauts into space. We can never resolve the problem of complexity, but you have to be sensitive to your organization and how it works. While a lot of us work in complex organizations, we don't really realize the way the organizations that we inhabit 
completely inhabit us.